Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Samantha Meckler. I'm a senior policy advisor in ONC's Office of Policy. I'm joined this afternoon with my colleague, Joanna Henry. I'm going to offer a few introductory remarks for our breakout session this afternoon, and Joanna will introduce our panelists and provide additional remarks as well. I want to thank you for joining us um, and also indicate uh, my colleague, Beth Myers, who's our deputy director in our Office of Policy, will also be joining us toward the end for the Q&A portion of our breakout session this afternoon. So data tagging and consent are important for improving interoperability while protecting patient privacy and choice, and also for helping to advance health equity and addressing health disparities. This standard can support various use cases from pediatrics to SUD, and also included for the social determinants of health data use and interoperability. During this session, you'll hear firsthand from stakeholders leading collaborative efforts focused on advancing data tagging adoption and use, and also from stakeholder-led efforts to integrate consent into social determinant of health terminology activities. You'll also hear of upcoming activities as part of ONC's project, Advancing SDOH Health IT Enabled Tools and Data Interoperability. At ONC, we're focused and on working collaboratively with stakeholders to support the further use and adoption of the standard, which we finalized at granular granular levels in recent rulemaking. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Joanna Henry, um, and thank you again for joining us. Joanna? Great. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so we'll be hearing from several speakers today. First, we have Dr. Hannah Galvin, who is the Chief Medical Information Officer at Cambridge Health Alliance, and she is also the Chief Founder and Co-Lead for the Protecting Privacy to Promote Interoperability, also known as PP2PI Work Group at HL7. Uh, she'll be accompanied by her colleague, Chaitan Saurabhu, he, who is the clinical instructor at Stanford Medicine and is a co-chair of the Protecting Privacy to Promote Interoperability work group, along with Dr. Galvin. After that presentation, we will hear from Amber Patel, who works with Security Risk Solutions Incorporated, who is the project manager for an ONC-sponsored project on data tagging. And then our last speaker will be Bob Dieterle, the technical director for the Gravity Project. Each presenter will present for about 10 to 15 minutes. And after that, we'll have question and answers that you are free to put in the chat or the speaker box. Before we get started, just a couple of announcements. After this session, just a couple of hours after, the recordings will be available in this platform. Uh, you can also and join us for the session chat that is located at the bottom left hand side of your screen. If you have any technical issues, please visit the help desk located in the annual meeting lobby. And if you love social media, you can tweet using ONC2021 hashtag. And with that, we'll hear from Dr. Galvin and Sarah Boo. Thanks, Joanna and Sam. It's great to be here this afternoon. Um, so as Joanna said, I'm Hannah Galvin. I'm uh, the Chief Medical Information Officer at Cambridge Health Alliance in the Boston area. And I'm here with Dr. Chetan Sarabu, uh, who is uh, an informaticist and pediatrician um, at Stanford Medicine. And today we are uh, presenting as co-leads of the Protecting Privacy to Promote Interoperability work group. Um, Dr. Saragu is also uh, a director of clinical informatics at ShareCare, uh, though this presentation poses no conflicts uh, to either of us. Um, the, protect the Protecting Privacy to Promote Interoperability Workgroup is a national workgroup uh, that formed initially in 2018 and was formalized in 2020 with the purpose of really trying to address this issue of how do you granularly segment data um, to protect uh, patients' privacy, give them options, um, and uh, enable interoperability while at the same time uh, allowing patients to have choice um, and uh, uh, pr protect against disparities uh, so that patients could make those choices in a granular fashion. The work group is supported by HIMSS, by IHE USA, um, uh, and the Drummond Group uh, Trusted Test Lab and Certification Body. We do have membership from HL7, as Joanna mentioned, um, but uh, we are not 
uh, formerly part of the HL7 infrastructure. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, the group has grown rapidly. It's now a multidisciplinary work group of over 160 experts in the industry. We have stakeholders across the entire ecosystem uh, of US healthcare. There's uh, provider organizations and institutions, individual providers, professional societies, um, both clinical professional societies and health IT professional societies, uh, standards development organizations, including HL7 and IHE, health IT vendors, um, health information exchanges and interoperability frameworks, Payers are involved, uh, government, uh, including ONC, HHS, the VA. Uh, we have contractors, both government and non-governmental contractors. Experts in privacy law and ethics are involved in the work group, as well as patient advocates. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chathan to now um, talk a little bit about the work that we do and starting with a clinical case. Chathan. Thank you, Hannah. So meet Paul. Paul is a 72-year-old retired teacher who is visiting his primary care physician for an annual physical exam. He has a long problem list of many medical conditions, but also suffers from alcoholism, which has had uh, recently had a number of relapses and was recently diagnosed with underlying depression for which he's taking medication. He's also accompanied by his wife, Donna, at his healthcare visits. Donna is 74 years old and has been designated as his healthcare power of attorney. She has confided to the healthcare provider that Paul has been having some difficulty with short-term memory issues, including keeping track of his medical appointments. And she's requested proxy access to Paul's patient portal account, including his notes, to be able to help him with his visits. When the healthcare provider examines Paul alone, Paul mentions that he has not discussed certain issues with his wife. He hasn't discussed his depression diagnosis. However, he does admit that it would be helpful if Donna is able to access some of his information, like his INR numbers, to be able to help with his medical management. And then he also expresses the desire for some of his other healthcare providers, like his optometrist, to not know about his mental health or substance use disorder information. And finally, when asking if Donna could have access to his portal, he said he doesn't really want her prying into his medical affairs. And so this really helps to set up the broader challenge of many of the interlocked uh, complications between sharing medical information. Now, turning yeah. it back to Hannah. Yeah, so as, as Chathan mentioned, you know, clinical cases like this uh, are really uh, commonplace for providers like myself, providers like Chathan, and, and many of the others who, who got together initially uh, to form the basis of what would become the Protecting Privacy to Promote Interoperability work group. Uh, we noticed this problem in a clinical level and then started talking to others who really uh, had noted the problem in other areas of the industry as well. When it comes to sharing information uh, and private healthcare information between various parts of the healthcare ecosystem, between healthcare providers and organizations, between patients and families, this can really only be accomplished freely when we have some agreement across the industry on the need for privacy versus the need for patient safety. How do you, how do you um, uh, reconcile those two? How do you identify sensitive information and how do you tag that sensitive information in a way that we've all agreed upon? How do you then go about protecting that sensitive information, not only in your home medical record, but when it's shared in the multiple ways that it's shared in other medical records, in HIEs, with uh, uh, various other organizations um, and uh, um, uh, other uh, potential with payers um, and in, in quality measures in the various ways that we share uh, health information in research per for research purposes. If you are going to share that health information, how do you display the, the information? And if it's not being shared, how do you display it in a way that indicates that it's not being shared? And then how would you share and reshare that sensitive information as it gets uh, uh, sort of transmitted throughout the health 
healthcare system and the healthcare ecosystem. So there are many sort of different questions here. And when we when we finally come to some agreement on those, then we can potentially share information safely. Um, so why is this such a challenge? And why are developing standards for this such a challenge? Well, at the very heart of it, there are a ton of different stakeholders um, and uh, a, a lot of different views and, and many different cooks in the kitchen um, uh, on this very important issue. There are many, many different types of data um, and uh, that data is handled very differently uh, by the different data holders. Um, the flow of data is incredibly complex, both internally to a particular healthcare organization or any particular data holder um, and externally as that data is shared. There are questions around data ownership. Does the patient own their healthcare data? Does the, the organization uh, which recorded that data um, own that data, uh, uh, or, or is it some combination of the two? There are questions around access control, and how do you define access control? Is it at the individual level? Is it at the role level? Is it at the organizational level, so somewhere in between? And as I mentioned before, there are these questions of patient safety versus the right to individual privacy. Do I, as a clinician, need access to all of this information, all of the potential information in order to ensure that the patient gets the best and the safe, the safest care? Do I have a medical legal risk if I don't have access to all of that information? Um, and, and the development and, implementations of, and implementation of standards is just complex at, at its face. And, and so for many of these reasons, the industry has sort of just kick the can down the road and said, this is too big to tackle. We have other things to think about. Uh, we have uh, a macro to think about. We have uh, 21st century cures to think about. And, and this just can't, we just can't tackle this right now. So, so what's happened is that in the current state, there remain state privacy laws and organizations have had to enable blunt privacy protections in order to comply with the state laws because states have have said, you know, you can't share certain types of information. Maybe it's maybe it's uh, um, adolescent privacy information. Maybe it's substance use information as part of 42 CFR Part 2. Maybe it's, and that's a federal law, maybe it's HIV information. Um, and so patients with that type of sensitive information um, in, in many of these situations have to choose whether to share all of their data or none of their data because they uh, because we don't have the technology to allow them to share at the granular level. So patient A in this slide who doesn't have any sensitive data, they go to another organization or they want to share with uh, a, a member of their care team, a, a spouse or, or a healthcare proxy on the portal, and the data just flows. And so they have great care. Let's say they're seen in the ER, all the data flows, their meds, their allergies, everything flows. Patient B has some sensitive data in their chart, let's say it's a behavioral health condition, and they have to decide whether or not they're going to share all of their data, including that sensitive data, or none of their data. And now they're seen in the, the ER for the same condition as, as patient A, but maybe none of their data flows. And now we are in, inadvertently creating healthcare disparities for patients who have sensitive data. So what have we done so far about this? Um, there have been previous efforts that I think many of, uh, uh, of you may have heard of or have been involved in. Uh, the data segmentation for privacy uh, standard uh, initially introduced in 2011 um, and approved as an HL7 standard in 2014 um, has been uh, implemented in, in several settings quite successfully. It focuses on that substance use disorder use case um, and uh, initially was focused around the CCDA and tagging of sending and receiving data using the CCDA. It's now expanded to be able to tag uh, uh, using the FIRE standard um, and to tag more granularly. Um, and then the consent to share open source tool was developed by SAMHSA um, and uh, was sort of built around the DS4P standard, allowing sort of an engine for patient consent management and access control services on the back end. And that was also implemented uh, in several settings uh, and implemented successfully in those several settings. But, but adoption of these uh, tools, the standard and the, the resulting tool have lagged. And why have they lagged? Why have they only um, been implemented in these sort of pilot implementations and then lagged? 
And I would say that they've lagged for a number of reasons. One is, is a real lack of financial or regulatory stimulus. In, in the most recent uh, 20, 21st Century Cures, um, NPRM and, and, and resulting act, they were introduced as, a, as optional to the pediatric certification and to the OUD um, treatment and prevention certification, but they're optional. They're not, there's no sort of stimulus saying, hey, you got to do this um, or you're going to get a, to give you a carrot or, or you, you're going to get a stick. Um, so, so there's really no sort of stimulus to drive the industry forward. And part of the reason that there isn't a stimulus is because these are really, really hard to do. Um, they're not easily scalable across organizations. And when you talk to leaders at organizations about implementing these, um, a lot of leaders say, yeah, this is really important, but there's a lot of other things going on that are really important. And right now, DS4P and Consent to Share don't meet a lot of the high priority clinical use cases that they're hearing about from their providers. They meet the substance use clinical use case, but not some of the issues that we have uh, around adolescence, some of the issues that we have uh, around other behavioral health conditions uh, besides substance use disorders um, and um, things like dementia. And um, and so if it's not going to meet sort of all of these, all of the, these high priority clinical use cases, uh, expending time and energy and resources toward this um, is that's hard to justify. And finally, one of the biggest issues is that the implementation guides uh, for or the implementation guide for TS4P doesn't really adequately address issues related to patient safety and usability. Um, and, and the pilots, uh, I don't think have, have really, they may have addressed them for their sites, but in a scalable way have not addressed these questions of if I redact data, what happens? Um, how do I surface this in a way where my providers know that this data has been redacted and um, that they can treat the patient safely? Um, so to that end, we um, brought together uh, stakeholders from across the industry into the Protecting Privacy and Promoting Interoperability uh, work group. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jason to talk about our work. Thank you, Hannah. So you heard about the challenges and why previous efforts have only gotten us so far. So what are we doing differently to advance to advance this cause? One, you know, we are building off of previous work and looking at what has been established already, understanding what has worked and what hasn't worked. But really to take it to the next level, we're working on expanding the use cases expanding the use cases to more widely encountered situations. We are also in defining those use cases, working with experts, with stakeholders across the industry, from providers to health IT vendors, to experts in, in the law, in ethics, in policy. And then with all of these different expert stakeholders that we've gathered and the use cases that we've we will um, continue to define in a collaborative process. We plan to build a consensus-driven implementation guide as a key deliverable. Going beyond just a technical standard, we are working on advancing technical standards, but a key part of this is an implementation guide that gets at really the thorny issues of real-world use cases. And finally, we also hope to build upon advances in technology since this work had initially started. Technologies like NLP, natural language processing, have matured since the DSV, DS4P standard first started. NLP is still a maturing technology, but we are looking at the use of NLP and, and other technologies for services like a sensitive data labeling service. And Hannah will go into that in a bit more detail um, towards the end. And so our work group has formed and we have four use cases that we have defined the scope of. We've had a broad uh, clinical subgroup that has looked at some of the most common scenarios that are very challenging for organizations to, to deal with in terms of maintaining, uh, in terms of protecting privacy. And those four use cases you can see on the right hand side are a mother infant use case where a mother's maternal data, the substance use, her substance use data ends up in her child's chart. And we're looking at some of the concerns 
of what happens with that child's data in terms of the mother's data that's there. We're looking at an adolescent use case, which is around reproductive health in terms of what happens with that data when a parent or guardian accesses the adolescent's information in a portal, as well as how that information flows from one EHR to another EHR. Then we're looking at an adult use case that we're developing in collaboration with the Gravity Project around social determinants of health data, particularly intimate partner violence and data and how when that is collected in a healthcare setting using a mobile app, how is that data protected as it flows through the system? And then the fourth use case is the geriatric use case, very similar to the story of Paul and Donna that you heard earlier about a behavioral health situation in a geriatric or elderly patient and what might happen if they have a healthcare power of attorney or healthcare agent who might be helping manage some of that data. And so we have defined these use cases. And in addition to what you see here, there's a lot more depth of details of the codes and uh, all of the, the, the information that goes behind each of these. And with those, we hope to draft a minimal set of sensitive data elements that could potentially lead to standards revision. We've also started to identify gaps in the current technical standards. And we're doing this all in a consensus driven way, developing terminology value sets. Um, we're working on recommendations for role-based versus user-based security, looking at how we might visualize redacted data, how we might, how redacted data might flow downstream into CDS. And then finally, policies, procedures to look at what happens when this data might need to be accessed through initiatives uh, or protocols like Break the Glass. And there's much more be beyond this too, but this is just to give everyone a flavor of the type of use cases and work we're doing. And to advance this work, um, you heard that we have over 160 stakeholders. We've decided to split up into smaller subgroups. We have foundational subgroups, like the clinical subgroup that has been defining these use cases, where we have representatives across um, multiple clinical specialties. Then we have experts in usability and implementation that are looking at how do these actually work in the real world from perspectives on the patient side, as well as providers, as well as HIM and other users. We then have a standards and terminology subgroup that has really been working on um, a lot of the technical standards with these sensitive data elements. And then all of this work is being informed by overarching subgroups from the patient perspective, from the legal perspective and the ethical uh, perspective, because many of these areas, many of the data that's sensitive have a huge um, complexity around what state you're talking about. And so there's all of those different perspectives that we have brought in into the process. And just to show you where, where we've come from, we started initially in May 2020. We kicked off at the HIMSS virtual conference and we developed a charter, got the work, working group together, and then started to hone those initial use cases, split into our subgroups, and then since that time have had progress from each of the subgroups. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah to share what we are um, doing this year and aiming to do beyond that. Thanks, Jathan. I think we have a little bit of animation on this on this slide. I'll just move it through. So, so uh, in this next year, going into the following year, we have uh, a, a lot on our roadmap. Um, as Jathan mentioned, we have these use cases that are developed. We are still working with the Gravity Project to finalize the, the SDOH use cases, and we are continuing to sort of hone the use cases. I see some some helpful feedback in the chat. Um, it, yes, there's there are uh, various other potential use cases um, that may be in phase two as well. Um, but uh, trying to hone these use cases as our additional uh, work groups get a hold of them and start working with them. 
is what we're, we're focused on for this uh, uh, sort of phase of the project, as well as if we're identifying additional use cases to make sure that they uh, are added to our parking lot as well to address. Uh, there are so many numerous factors um, that can play into these privacy considerations. From a, a terminology and standards perspective, um, we are focused on, as Jathan had said, identifying sensitive data elements, also identifying what areas of, of uh, terminology we would need to uh, look at. Um, SAMHSA had initially identified uh, some value sets and, and had uh, um, stewarded value sets and VSAC value sets um, that they will no longer be stewarding. And we are trying to take those up, identify a steward and update those terminology value sets um, to be appropriate for our use cases. As Chathan had mentioned, we are looking at developing a security labeling service um, as we really think about sort of what, how we can leverage technology to do this. One of the primary concerns has been, how am I as a provider going to granularly tag everywhere in the chart and say, okay, they can have this piece of data, but they can't have this piece of data. They can have this piece of data, but they can't have this piece of data. What we really need is for this to be automated and to be able to tag on the back end for the, for the patient to be able to define a policy and say, I want to be able to share my reproductive health data with these providers and my behavioral health data with these providers. In order to do that, you have to define what do you mean by reproductive health data? What do you mean by behavioral health data? So we need some terminology value sets in order to do that. And once you're able to define that, then you're able to set policy uh, to to uh, meet those those terminology standards and and then you can automate those preferences um, using a security labeling service so that's the goal uh, is to, to first define those terminology value sets uh, then we will work with the hl7 security work group uh, to ballot for standards revision we'll start with one use case there um, we do have our usability and implementation work group working on persona pieces around our use cases in order to support that standards revision. The, that work group is also coming up with some questions as we talked about around redacted data, around what do we do with decision support. And we will be moving forward with the Delphi method um, to, uh, uh, to, to really understand what our expert stakeholders um, think we should, how, how we think we should handle some of these really uh, challenging questions and questions that have really been sort of plaguing uh, the industry. And then we'll move forward once we have that sort of first uh, draft of some implementation guidance um, to a sandbox implementation over the next um, two, one and a half to two years is, is our thought. So. Uh, that's what this will look like uh, with um, getting some implementation guidance via the Delphi method, sandbox demonstration, and then hopefully a real world demonstration in the next two years. So uh, that's where we are. We would love if anyone from this uh, group um, wanted to get involved, please do contact us. Uh, Serena Mack from the Drummond Group has been an invaluable resource and can certainly add you to our uh, meeting invites and Chathan and I would also be happy to talk with you um, about the work. And with that, uh, I, I feel like we've gone over our time. I would like to, to make sure that we turn it over to the, to the next presenter uh, and we're happy to answer any questions at the end as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amber Patel, and I'm the project manager for ONC's Advancing SDOH Health IT Enabled Tools and Data Interoperability Project. And today I'm just gonna give you guys a brief project introduction and overview. And because our project focuses exclusively on social determinants of health, I thought it would be helpful to start off with a pretty widely recognized definition of social determinants of health. So the World Health Organization describes SDOH as the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. So if you look over here at this right-hand graphic, you can see this includes socioeconomic factors, so education, job status, family, social support, income, community safety. 
It includes your physical environment. Do you have access to green space? What is the material build of your home? Health behaviors, tobacco use, diet and exercise, alcohol use, sexual activity. And all of these things come together to make up to 80% of a person's health. And then here you see that the remaining 20% is really the provision of healthcare being provided. So this makeup of a person's health is being increasingly recognized by the healthcare community. And now the focus is on how do we use this data to improve health outcomes? So ONC included social, psychological, and behavioral health data criteria in their 2015 edition of Health IT Certification, which encompasses these eight domains here, financial resource strain, social connection, isolation, highest level of education, exposure to violence, stress, feelings of depression, level of physical activity, and alcohol use. Now, since the release of their 2015 certification edition, 97 health IT developers have voluntarily certified 117 unique products to an SDOH-oriented certification criterion. These 97 developers provide technology to approximately half of all office-based clinicians and less than 5% of hospitals. So this information is really up to date. I got this from ONC about two weeks ago. Um, one thing I did wanna point out that I thought was interesting was um, before this update, the developers had provided technology to about a third of hospitals. So you see this change from a third to 5% um, because one large vendor had retired one of its modules that was certified in SDOH certification criteria, which explains this decrease. Um, so our project, um, our scope is to advance the interoperability of SDOH data by supporting stakeholder-led efforts to conduct data tagging and to determine the feasibility of developing clinical decision support for SDOH. So as we see it, we have two important tools at our disposal to advance the interoperability of SDOH, and that's data tagging and clinical decision support. So data tagging helps enable the movement and set up the movement of sensitive SDOH data in that as a patient, I may not feel comfortable um, disclosing certain sensitive information if I feel like it's not gonna be protected downstream. And then CDS helps enable a provider to integrate SDOH decision-making data into their workflow, making it more likely that they use that information at the point of care. So our project objectives in the realm of data tagging include providing technical and subject matter expertise to support and inform the successful implementation of data tagging for SDOH use cases. And this is where we found that our project was slightly ahead of its time in that our search for stakeholders utilizing data tagging for SDOH use cases, we didn't find um, anything that aligned nicely to our timeframe of our project. So I'll go over our timeframe um, in the next slide here. Another project objective is to support collaborative learning and dissemination among interested stakeholders in data tagging. So we do have a web learning event coming up that I will also detail in a couple of slides. And then finally, to collate a written deliverable for ONC featuring lessons learned and challenges to help inform future implementations and considerations. Our project objectives for CDS are to help inform a feasible approach to developing CDS, to incorporate SDOH into direct clinical care, and then again, to develop a report for LNC that details our findings of SDOH as incorporated in practice guidelines to help inform future approaches. So this is just a snapshot of our project timeline. We kicked off in September of 2020. Um, we conducted outreach, we onboarded stakeholders. You may have heard me give a similar presentation in the PP to PI work group. You may have seen our project go out in a Gravity e-blast, um, as well as a HIMSS SDOH stakeholder work group e-blast. And we were able to recruit 13 stakeholders um, from all across various healthcare settings. So we had HIEs, we had FQHCs, we had SDOH platform vendors. And what we really wanted to do was talk to them about their capture, utilization, and exchange of SDOH data. So we're here now at the red arrow. We are nearing our end of our focus on data tagging, which will culminate in our data tagging web learning event. And then after that is finished, we'll shift our focus to the CDS portion of our project. We have project SMEs and we'll work with them on identifying specialty practice guidelines with SDOH components and determining the feasibility of CDS. We will then report our findings on data tagging and CDS to ONC, and then our project um, wraps up September of this year, 2021. So as I had mentioned, we had identified various stakeholders from different healthcare settings, um, and we spoke to them primarily about the collection, utilization, and exchange of SDOH data. Um, and looking back through our interviews and our notes, we had initial broad takeaways that I wanted to share with you guys today. 
So firstly, we heard that there's a real need for standardization in how to represent SDOH electronically. And this begins at the point of collection. So several of our stakeholders indicated that they were using various assessments to collect SDOH data. And while there is good reason for it, I think it highlights the challenges of standardization from the outset. And of course, we have a great group of people working on this, the Gravity Project, which Bob will talk about here shortly. And then secondly, SDOH information is currently primarily used for referrals. This is somewhat obvious, but I feel like it highlights that we're using it in one of many ways that SDOH information can be used. Um, I also put this here because I wanted to introduce SDOH platform vendors, which really enable these referrals. So those are organizations like Unitas, NowPow, Aunt Bertha, and several others. Um, we did hear from some stakeholders that they use this information internally as well. So one FQHC had reported that they were having issues with no-shows. Um, they looked through their SDOH data that found out that they had a transportation issue. So they applied for a grant, got some community health workers on board, and now they have community health workers working to organize transportation for people um, who had said that was an issue initially. Um, third, we have heard that there is interest in the data segmentation for privacy fire standard when it does become available to allow more granular tagging of data, which will help enable other use cases such as more granular patient consent. And then last but not least, something that I think was probably the most critical piece of information we got was that utilization of SDOH data is not limited to the healthcare setting. So you have social service agencies, you have community-based organizations, everyone is using this data, and there's a real need to facilitate cross-domain collaboration and coordination to support future interoperability of SDOH data. So onto our web learning event, we don't have a date determined yet, but we are targeting late April, early May. Um, we are envisioning this will be a two-part webinar, probably spaced about a week apart. The first one is looking like it's gonna be an hour and a half, um, and the second one probably an hour, and it's really for anyone interested in SDOH data tagging and particularly the intersection of both. So we have three goals for this web learning event. First, we're hoping to provide an overview and status of relevant data tagging fire standards available to support SDOH interoperability. We want to relate information from those testing these standards or those that aim to use them in the future for SDOH interoperability. And then finally, and I think this goes back to the last point on my previous slide, we're really hoping to provide a forum for stakeholder collaboration and highlight opportunities to connect with others in the space. So if this sounds like something you're interested in, I've included a link to our Confluence site. Please follow us. Um, as soon as we get that date nailed down, we will post it here. And with that, last but not least, here's a list of contacts for our project. If anything I said today resonated with you um, and you'd like to reach out and learn more, please contact any of us, Jonathan, myself, Greg, Joanna, or Sam. We would be happy to talk with you further about this. And with that, thank you guys. And I will turn it over to Bob from Gravity Project. Okay, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, walk us through uh, the work we have been doing on the Gravity Project, in particular around the uh, consent mechanism for exchanging social determinants of health information. Uh, first, we'll do a little bit of a background on the Bra Gravity Project itself, talk a little bit about the terminology workstream overview, uh, and then talk about uh, the technology workstream, and you'll see how those two interrelate in a second. Then we'll focus on sensitive data and consent issues, and finally talk about how to get involved. So background, the Gravity Project was formed in May of 2019. It was uh, created by the, uh, the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network, Network SIREN, uh, from the University of San Francisco, uh, with funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in partnership with EMI Advisors. The scope of the uh, Gravity Project is to develop standards to represent patient level social determinants of health data documented across four different clinical activities, screening, assessment or diagnosis, goal setting, and treatment slash interventions. We have a number of, uh, uh, shall we say, very interested parties that are helping to fund our activities and to go and uh, participate in them, uh, including a, a number of payer organizations, provider organizations, uh, we have a number of uh, technology vendors as well as participation uh, from the uh, public health government and social services environment. 
The leadership of the Gravity Program uh, is on this slide. Uh, Evelyn Diego is the uh, Program Manager from EMI Advisors. Carrie Lewisberg is the Project Manager, again from EMI Advisors. Mark Savage uh, handles our policy issues. He's the policy lead, uh, comes out of uh, U USF and uh, Siren. And then uh, uh, Sarah DeSilvey is the Clinical Informatics Director from the University of Vermont. and I am the technical director uh, from Enable Care. In August of 2019, Gravity Project became an official HL7 accelerator, which is designed to help implementers across the healthcare spectrum create fire implementation guides and other informative documents. Uh, some of the other fire accelerators, which I'm sure you've heard about on these calls, uh, include the Argonaut Project, uh, the Karen Alliance, Codex, uh, and the Da Vinci Project. We have a public collaborative. Virtually everything we do is uh, uh, basically uh, uh, receives input from and overview of uh, the public collaborative. Uh, across the various activities that we have had over the last two years, we've had roughly 1,800 different participants for virtually all of the uh, stakeholder groups, clinical provider groups, community-based organizations, standards development organizations, federal and state governments, payers, and technology vendors. You see on the slide two of the public calls that we have. Uh, we have a call uh, every other Thursday uh, from 4 to 5.30 on uh, uh, Thursday. Uh, it's a public call going over uh, terminology and technology issues. And then we have a technical fire IG call from three to four uh, Eastern every Wednesday to uh, go over the uh, and work on the uh, fire implementation guide. As I said, we have two different work streams. We have a technology work stream, uh, which is on the right, uh, talking about developing the uh, implementation guide, balloting it, developing it, and ultimately testing it and putting it into production. We have a terminology work stream, which is led by Sarah DeSilve, which is focused on for identifying for each of the different associated terms of health domains, uh, coding requirements, coding gaps, uh, identifying specific uh, data sets, and ultimately publishing those uh, in NLM, uh, VSAC, uh, uh, and ONC ISA. This is our timeline for both the terminology and technology work. Uh, I won't go into great detail here. We'll talk about it again at the end of the presentation. Uh, but we have a number of parallel efforts going on around social determinants of health terminology, focusing on the different domains. And then we have uh, a concerted effort going on uh, around developing the uh, FIRE-based uh, social determinants of health implementation guide. In the terminology work stream, there are roughly 18 different domains that we're focused on. Uh, food insecurity, transportation insecurity, financial insecurity, material hardship, et cetera. Each one of these uh, has its own subject matter experts, has its own community calls, and focuses on creating uh, terminologies, uh, SNOMED CT, ICD-10, uh, uh, LOINC codes uh, for uh, the uh, assessment surveys for each of these domains. As you can see here, we focus on screening and assessment using LOINC, uh, focus on diagnoses using uh, SNOMED CT and ICD-10, focus on LOINC uh, coding of goals. We're also looking at SNOMED coding of goals and SNOMED CT interventions. It's a little broader than that. We'll talk about it on a future slide. On the technical work stream, uh, we have completed the development of the uh, implementation guide, the Social Determinants of Health Clinical Care Fire Implementation Guide. We balloted it in January, uh, in the January cycle uh, for HL7 ballots. It includes coverage for assessments, health concerns or problems, goals, referrals, consents, and aggregation for exchanging or reporting. It's important to remember that fire implementation guides are focused on interoperability. This is focused on how we exchange this information between stakeholders. The implementation guide is a framework implementation guide and supports multiple domains, basically is capable of supporting any of the domain work that is being done by the terminology side. Here are the primary exchanges that we're focused on. 
uh, focused on the ability of a patient to have an assessment uh, and ultimately to create the output of that assessment and make it available to both the uh, provider, the patient, and the other organizations that uh, need to understand the uh, patient's social risk and have a right to do so. Uh, we're focused on exchanges of, uh, in particular, referrals, uh, but also some of the other information that supports it between the uh, provider organization and community-based referral organizations. Uh, also between provider organizations and community-based organizations, such as food pantries or others that provide services directly, and then the ability to exchange information with responsible parties, such as a payer who's covering uh, healthcare costs for a particular set or cohort of patients. So as we look at this as a stack, the first step is to go and do the assessment. Our survey, uh, link coded, we're working with uh, Regan Streif to link code both the questions and answers uh, to create a set of defined uh, health concerns or problems or diagnoses that are SNOMED CT and ICD-10 coded. Use those or where it's appropriate, create goals or patient center goals uh, using both LOINC and SNOMED CT. Ultimately to create interventions, again, using SNOMED CT, CPT and HCPCS, and then record the outcomes of those as procedures that have been completed to document the results, if you will, uh, using SNOMED CT, CPT and HCPCS. And then to gather that information for quality measures. Throughout this, we have to be concerned about consent of the individual to share this information or to protect it. And so we have an approach to consent that is a, being used for this uh, uh, standard for trial use level one um, uh, implementation guide. Then we also have the ability to aggregate uh, quick cohorts of uh, patients for reporting. Some of the issues that we deal with when uh, addressing uh, social determinants of health and consent and there's a lot of work going on around data tagging. I'm not going to try to talk much about data tagging, rather talk about the consent process. Uh, some samples of sensitive data are those things that are clearly sensitive to virtually everybody. Uh, uh, um, spousal abuse, uh, immigration status, or interpersonal, interpersonal violence or interpartner violence, I should say here. Uh, frequently sensitive data include things like homelessness, uh, employment status, Less obviously sensitive data includes, for many people, home address and telephone number. So we have to be careful that we don't take things that are typically uh, patient-level demographics and assume that they're not sensitive. Um, down in the bottom here, we talk about uh, the protections that are afforded uh, to personal information. Uh, HIPAA defines uh, for covered entities. Uh, and personal health information, uh, allowed exchanges between uh, covered entities around treatment, payment, and operations, uh, but requires patient consent to release beyond covered entities or TPL, with minor exceptions. Federal regulations, such as 42 CFR Part 2, provide protection for specific types of uh, information, uh, particularly uh, around federally funded substance abuse centers. And then state regulations vary considerably in what they consider to be sensitive information. Uh, it can range from HIV status to uh, uh, sexual activity on minors uh, to uh, mental health, et cetera. Uh, and in some cases, they do protect information regarding social determinants of health, but not in a uniform way. So specific examples of consent um, that patients are concerned about, in particular around social determinants of health, uh, I will not share the sensitive data with anyone, uh, or I will share sensitive data with specific individuals or organizations, and in many cases, they want protection against re-release of information. I'll share specific data with specific organizations for purposes of referrals or interventions, which is where we are focused, and will not share data with specific organizations due to lack of trust or experience. People have already had situations where uh, they are uncomfortable with a particular organization and do, want do not want data shared. And they need the ability to revoke an existing consent. So we have focused on the following. The ability of a patient or provider to, design, to find consent related to interventions or referrals. And we've taken a look at the larger environment and when that intervention or referral goes to, for example, a business associate, 
we exchange the consent with that business associate. And that's the basis on which they are then able to release information to a non-HIPAA covered entity. If we're working directly with a non-HIPAA covered entity, then what we do is we keep the consent internal and the fact that we're allowing the exchange is predicated on the fact that consent currently exists. We need to get more sophisticated. We need to deal with community sharing. Uh, but for this version of the implementation guide, this is where we are uh, defining the consent to share process for social determinants of health interventions. This is the work that we've done on the consent uh, resource. We have a profile for it. It's in process of uh, going through reconciliation based on ballot uh, uh, comments. Uh, as we said, it is used primarily uh, to uh, exchange with uh, business associates uh, and allow them to exchange that information uh, with non-covered entities. There are a number of work groups that are working on uh, data tagging and uh, consent. That includes the security work group at HL7, uh, working on both. Uh, we have community-based care and privacy group, which is the owner of the consent resource. Uh, patient care through the work we're doing with Gravity and other work they're doing around care planning. It's also dealing with consent. And then at the moment, we only have two implementation guides defining consent profiles that we're aware of. The one that we've worked on, Social Determinants of Health Fire Implementation Guide, and the Bidirectional Services E-Referrals Fire Implementation Guide. The status right now is we've gone through ballot We've had 63 uh, affirmatives, 30 negatives. Uh, we basically passed the 60% threshold to publish as an STU-1 once we have gone through the rest of the ballot reconciliation. Uh, we had a total of 227 uh, comments, 72 were negative, 155 were affirmative comments, uh, which could be typos, comments, questions, uh, et cetera. Uh, we are at the moment uh, working through that set, and we have roughly 88 to go. Our intent is to finish up ballot reconciliation at the end of April uh, and have the uh, technical portion, at least, of the implementation guide ready for the May Connectathon. We intend to go and exercise the implementation guide and a reference implementation that's being built uh, at the May Connectathon, get some feedback, and be able to go and uh, provide uh, that uh, as updates to the implementation guide prior to publication. So what's next? We're working with uh, NLM and Reagan Street to continue to advance the tooling related to surveys, working with the community to establish clinical content required for the, the social determinants of health domains, advancing development of the reference implementation, uh, incorporating dispositions from the comments, as we said, uh, and then uh, we want to talk about how to engage. Uh, come join our project. Uh, the information is here. Uh, help us find new sponsors and partners. And then ultimately uh, submit your data for uh, the SOH domains that Sarah is working on. Uh, and you have the links here to come and work with us at any level you deem appropriate. And that is it. I believe we have some time left now for some questions. Is that correct? Yes. Um, first, I want to thank all of our presenters for your wonderful um, information that you have shared. Uh, we have had great participation from our audience in the chat. Um, if you haven't been involved, that chat is on the left side of your screen. And uh, again, thank you all presenters for staying within your time because we do have enough time for questions and answers. Uh, this question is fair game for anyone on the panel. We'll start with what are immediate steps we can take now to advance both the sharing of SDOH data and the protection of sensitive information? So this is Bob. Um, let me let me uh, suggest for those of you that have an interest, come and participate in the pilot projects that we're in the process of forming uh, to test the implementation guide and to test the uh, terminologies that have been developed. Uh, we are looking at the ability to go and add on top of, for example, uh, a provider's EHR 
uh, supporting uh, the uh, Fire uh, API standard. Uh, the ability to have a uh, smart on fire application that could allow the individual to decide which information within reason should be shared. For example, to restrict access to their ad home address or their telephone number where it's appropriate. Something that would allow them to interact with their information uh, as long as it doesn't, uh, shall we say, uh, affect the downstream uh, ability for the uh, provider or service organization to provide the service. Great. Does any of our other panelists want to take a stab at that question? I would just add to echo what Bob said, you know, um, get involved. There's so many great groups out here who are trying to promote this work and move forward with it. Um, PP2PI, Gravity Project. We want to hear from you on our project. Um, so I've heard a lot from the stakeholders that they want more collaboration and coordination. So um, yeah, we're here as resources for you guys. So please reach out to us and, and get engaged. Thanks, Amber. And I, I would just echo that, um, you know, please, please do reach out uh, and, and get engaged for those that are starting to implement um, at your organization. If you are putting into place functionality that is sharing SDOH data or other data, I, I know uh, there was some, some discussion in the chat, right? This is a good time to talk about this because a, a lot of organizations, are, four or five is, is Monday, April 5th is Monday, and a lot of organizations are putting uh, um, uh, functionality into place to share data as part of the 21st Century Cures in, um, information blocking uh, um, rules and to be in compliance. And, and as you're doing that, as you're implementing that, as you're operationalizing it within your organization, you can bring invaluable experience to the work that we're doing in these groups um, because uh, that you know, you, you have your, your feet on the ground and can bring that that back to the groups. And so um, I would say, you know, the work is being done now and, and join up and give us give us your your experience um, and, and bring that back. So. OK, thank you. And Dr. Galvin, to your point, there's been a lot of conversation in the chat. Um, it's been a lot of conversation around privacy and security and some of the comments we received was, it may be useful to distinguish between privacy, which one may think of as law, and sensitivity, um, and issues by HIPAA. So what are your thoughts, not just Dr. Galvin, but anyone on the panel, what are your thoughts on differentiating uh, between the two? Yeah, so so I, I would think of privacy as the, um, uh, the ability to withhold information that I don't want shared. And, and security as sort of the, uh, the technical um, uh, uh, safety of my data as I, as I share it and uh, the ability to, to access data that, that can be accessed or that, that I should be able to access um, and not access data that should not be able to, to be accessed in, in a way that is um, uh, uh, that that um, is not um, breachable by uh, third parties or other parties, and and so I think there are multiple parts of security that are outlined in in HIPAA. But to be able to access the data that I I should be able to access, to not access the data that I'm I'm not supposed to be able to access. But privacy is is making that decision that I that I um, not have you know don't have um, that that I want to keep uh, some data. Uh, uh, directly to me. I, do others on the call have? I, I think there's probably more a more legal. You know, our policy experts have have more of a, a policy or legal definition. Um, but I think there's there are more technical pieces around that security and how do we keep the data uh, secure. Yeah, I I might just add. Um, you know. It, I think it is important to distinguish between the two. When you talk about privacy, you might have a lot of HIPAA implications, other laws, other regulations. Um, I do think, you know, having sensitive data and marking sensitive data is important. But I think, you know, from my previous life as a lawyer, if you could stay away from the legal side of things and stick to the policy and guidance, um, you have an easier road. <laughs> All 
All right, and I think we are just about at time. Um, so we don't have any more time for questions. I think I just want to leave to the panelists and others here. Um, do you have any kind of last comments that you want to share with the audience? All right. All right, if not, um, just a couple of reminders. Uh, thank you all of our panelists, our speakers, uh, for giving us your time. Thank you for all of our participants um, here online. After this time, there will be a 10 minute break. Um, and after that break, there will be the Health IT Consumers Tech Showcase, which are some great things there. Um, and in addition to all of that, we have one more day of the annual meeting. So please check out the exhibit hall that opens each morning at a.m. And if we did not get to your question, we see them in the chat and we'll try best as we can to do the follow up. Thank you. Thanks so very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.